Aloha, everybody. It is 12 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the first of three webinars we're going to be hosting this fall. On October 19th, we'll be discussing the care and conservation of Hawaiian crop diversity. And on November 16th, join us for a celebration of our top science and conservation accomplishments in 2022. Our November session will include a presentation on the new Mamba drone arm, which you may have seen um, announced in our communications this week. If you'd like to be kept in the know and aren't already subscribed to our monthly science and conservation newsletter, Go Botanical, you can sign up on our website and I'm about to drop the link and the chat for that, as well as the link to register for those two upcoming webinars I mentioned. So there you go. Um, this webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending the recording out to you in the next few days. Please feel free uh, throughout the presentation to ask questions using the chat feature. Uh, we'll also be holding a general Q&A at the end. We'll try to get to all of your questions, but if we don't, please feel free to follow up with me via email, uh, which I'll drop into the chat in a moment uh, um, as well. So we're hosting today's session from our Botanical Research Center on Kauai. I have with me Dr. Nina Ronsted, our Director of Science and Conservation, who will now tell you a little bit about today's session. Thanks, Nina. Hello, and welcome to all of you, wherever you are and in what time zone, as you can see. Uh, we are in Micronesia today, at least on our background. <laughs> uh, we are actually sitting at headquarters in, in Kauai. Um, so we are running these webinars as a way for you and everybody interested um, to get to meet the uh, scientists and conservation practitioners uh, who's doing all the great work that is happening here at the National Tropical Botanical Garden. Um, so each session kind of shifts a little bit thematically, but um, the idea really is for you to get a little bit behind the scenes and get a chance to ask questions and, and, and talk to us and us having a little more time to get into the depths of things. Um, and today we will be focusing on uh, the flora of Micronesia, which is one of our um, several flora programs in uh, the uh, Pacific, um, where we've been working for several decades, also producing a flora of Marquesas that came out last year and the flora of Samora, which is just on its way out. And it's not that you could produce a flora in a year, as they will tell you, that can take many, many years, but we're kind of rounding up several bigger projects at the moment. So very exciting times. Um, and after Dave, um, who will of course take you way into the field here and tell you about the latest expedition that we had over summer, um, we will continue with a little more reflective talk about um, botanical garden collections and how they are contributing to um, science and conservation. So somewhat linked, um, but not um, directly part of the Micronesia project as such. Anyways, um, I will hand over to Dave, who is our uh, senior uh, scientist and who's been running our flora programs for a long time. Uh, he's also our resident taxonomist um, and the go-to person for everything about identification and, and plant names in, in Hawaii and, and way beyond. Um, so we're very excited to have him here to um, take you on a trip. Welcome, Dave. Uh, thank you, Nina. I appreciate the introduction, and um, now I uh, welcome everyone to our webinar series. Today, I'd like to take you along um, with me on a trip to far western Micronesia to a little island nation uh, known as Palau. <clears throat> we uh, conducted a botanical expedition there this summer in June and July, and I'd like to share with you some of the work we're doing on the um, floor of Micronesia. All right, here, share this with you. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. So you might be asking, what is a flora? Well, a flora is basically, um, the plants of a given area. <clears throat> For example, it could be an island or a group of islands. Uh, the garden is well poised to be uh, studying the floras of these islands in the Pacific Ocean uh, because we're located in the mid-Pacific. Mid and uh, over the years, we've published, um, completed and published floras for a number of different uh, island groups, including Fiji, which was published by my predecessor, Dr. Smith, 
the Cook Islands flora, flora of Samoa, which is now in press, and um, also a flora of the Marquesas Islands with my collaborator at the Smithsonian, Warren Wagner. Um, the garden has been indirectly involved or directly involved in the flora of Hawaii as well, although we didn't publish it. We, we helped conduct research there with our collaborators at the Smithsonian and Bishop Museum. Uh, but now there are other areas that have floras that are sort of in progress. For example, the um, New Caledonia and Tahiti, which are both French uh, territories or French departments, and they've had floras ongoing for some years. <clears throat> and as Nina mentioned, we've been in involved in a flora of the Micronesian area for a number of years uh, at the garden, also in collaboration with other um, players. <clears throat> well, it's important. Floras are important because you really can't conserve what you don't know. And um, the first primary target of the global strategy for plant conservation is to um, produce an online flora of all known plants. And, well, there have been some steps taken and um, our flora of the Marquesas Islands and flora of Hawaii are online floras as well as in book form. Uh, we hope the flora of Samoa is gonna be published as a book, but we'll um, probably be putting that online at some point as well. And, and these are essential tools for teaching and uh, research and conservation. But they uh, require buy-in and um, promotion at the local level as well. It has to, Floras have to serve the uh, local communities on these islands. And when we conduct floras, our research for floras, we collect herbarium specimens, dried pressed plant specimens, which are an important uh, part of the project because they, um, they have the data where they were collected, um, what they're growing with when they're flowering or fruiting and uh, maybe uses uh, in, for example, in ethnobotanical uses. So they're pretty valuable and they are uh, deposited, in, uh, deposited in herbaria, such as here at the Botanical Garden and other museums. The uh, Micronesian region is, is quite large. It's about the size of the um, continental United States or also Australia, but its land area is only the size of Rhode Island one of our smallest states. <clears throat> there are about 2,100 islands and atolls in this area. And they form part of the uh, Polynesian Micronesian uh, biodiversity hotspot. So it's rich in plant diversity as well as uh, animal diversity, and birds. There are about 1,200 native um, or indigenous plant species in the Micronesian area of which uh, 365 are considered to be endemic. So the area we're looking at is uh, Palau here, the Republic of Palau, it's in far western Micronesia, just north of New Guinea and east of um, the Philippine Islands. Some of the other areas that we've worked in here are within these little blue boxes, Koshrai, Ponape, and Guam. So Micronesia is actually composed of five different uh, island groups um, and uh, politically five different uh, countries or territories. So. It's, it's a pretty diverse area. NTBG and the Smithsonian have been working on the floor of Micronesia for a number of years. Um, my colleague, Warren Wagner, who is the McBride chair here at NTBG, and I have um, put up an online checklist basically of the Micronesian plants uh, in 2004, but it's based on collections made by um, botanists at the Smithsonian, as well as literature, um, specimens and other herbaria and contributions by many uh, colleagues in different countries. So that's kind of a, the basis of uh, our project here. <clears throat> uh, it needs to be updated with more collections and uh, the nomenclature, for example, the plant names also need updating. There are popular books um, on the Micronesian plants, including this book on the um, trees of Palau by uh, Ann Kidalong, our colleague at the Palau National Museum, as well as ethnobotanical books that uh, Ann and, and our colleague at New York Botanical Garden have uh, published. But these are, they're useful, uh, but they actually lack the synthesis of a, of a comprehensive flora. And um, they're not really that adequate for conservation action as well. 
So we were fortunate, uh, the garden was fortunate to receive funding from the National Geographic Society for field work in the Carolyn Islands of which Palau is part. Uh, I, I applied about over two years ago for the funding and received it, but we've had to put it on hold, the project on hold because of COVID, the pandemic. Um, now, <clears throat> Palau has opened up to visitors, but Ponape hasn't, so we decided we'll focus on Palau. There's enough to do there. There are um, quite a few islands in, in Palau, and if you look on the uh, figure in the right hand and the map on the right, you can see the main island is uh, Bobble Dob or Bobble Plop. And uh, there are also a number of other islands, uh, about 340 total, including some of the small rock islands to the south, as well as um, some atolls to the north and south. So it's a <clears throat> sort of a far flung island nation uh, spread out pretty widely. Uh, it became independent in uh, <clears throat> 1994, and there are actually 16 different states in, in Palau. Uh, with a population total population of about eighteen thousand, um, so it's not a, not a big uh, nation, but it's very uh, biodiverse. The garden has um, has a fairly long history uh, in working in Micronesia. We participated in something like ten different field trips there with different um, government organizations. For example, the Forest Service. Um, to do some swamp forest uh, survey. And you can see on the left, lower left here, Tim Flynn slogging through the mud in a mangrove forest, uh, which we uh, participated in uh, some years ago. We've made collections in the parts of Micronesia for FEMA to replace plants lost during uh, Hurricane Iniki. Diane Ergoni has collected breadfruit there. Um, and uh, a couple of our staff participated in a, uh, a survey uh, of Guam, of the uh, Anderson Air Force Base. And this resulted in the discovery of a, a new species in the mint family. Actually, you can see an illustration here. It's related to uh, patchouli. So um, Warren Wagner and I published this a couple of years back. Um, it takes a lot of planning and logistics uh, work to prepare for an expedition like this. You've got to um, be in contact with your uh, collaborators in country. We've had uh, established memoranda of understanding with uh, the government of Palau, as well as the Palau National Museum and the community college. So we can work together as partners. Also collecting permits. I mentioned there were 16 different states um, in Palau and each state required a separate permit, uh, permit application. But fortunately we had our support from the Palau National Museum people, they helped us apply for the permits and uh, get them approved. Of course, flights and lodging all had to be um, taken care of and um, field preparation too. For example, um, packing uh, enough, you know, different supplies and, and things for collecting. And you can see in the photograph here with the backpack, including your field notes, water, clippers, headlamp, uh, various things, GPS, um, radio to keep in touch with your um, other members of the party. And then of course, um, meeting with the local officials once you <laughs> arrive in the country. <clears throat> um, and here we are in Palau at the National Museum and Botanical Garden, uh, meeting with some uh, representatives from the Koror State as well as the, the National Museum's director and uh, head of the uh, herbarium. And here she's showing us uh, some of the rare plants, uh, one of the rare plant species is a palm species actually that's being propagated there for uh, reintroduction and outplanting. So there's a lot of conservation action actually going on in Palau. Uh, may not be typical of all the other uh, Micronesian islands, however. Um, our trip uh, involved six uh, staff from NTBG and associates, uh, including Uma here from uh, Limahuli Preserve. Uh, this is Elliot Gardner in the center. And um, here I am pressing plants with one of our collaborators at the Palau National Museum, uh, Cholet who was very instrumental in helping us get the permits. And this is Seiya. 
who was a good field, young field collector. These are uh, junior botanists and uh, eager to learn more about the flora of Micronesia and also tremendously helpful in the collecting. We each uh, kept our own collecting series of numbers. And here are some of the other uh, people that were we went out in the field with, including rangers from the Forest Service, as well as the um, staff members from the museum and uh, community college. Uh, we learned as much from them, I think, or maybe more than they learned from us. So they were very helpful in guiding us around, taking us to the most interesting um, vegetation types and so forth. Well, one of the things we did there was to actually look, uh, look for new species, new and interesting species. Um, we had a checklist uh, generated from, from the website and other work, and uh, we were able to compare and identify plants using this checklist. And if it wasn't, a plant wasn't on the checklist, we, we could add it to the uh, record for the island. So there are a lot of, a lot of field work was involved. Um, it's going to different areas. This center photo is uh, one of the waterfalls on uh, Babeldaob, the main island of Palau. Uh, we focused on different plants. Uh, Tim here, on Tim Flynn on the left was uh, focused more on lichens um, and bryophytes, including mosses and liverworts. Uh, other people such as McKnight here climbed and helped uh, collect orchids growing in the trees, epiphytic orchids. We had a nice long pole that Elliot brought along for collecting canopy tree uh, branches. And all of this involved working together as a team. Once the specimens were collected, uh, we take information down in our uh, field books, uh, latitude, longitude from our GPS, elevation, uh, vegetation type, associated species, and then characteristics of the specimen that we were collecting. And then they'd be put into a field press that we carried around and usually in our backpacks. And uh, we have a mobile field station here, the truck, uh, the museum truck that uh, they let us use, which was um, really essential for our collecting purposes. And we bring the specimens back to the uh, our base of operations. For example, this one was house that we were staying at in Peleliu, and then we'd rearrange the specimens so they, uh, for their final sort of positioning before we put them in the dryer. In Peleliu, there wasn't any uh, plant dryer, so we had to bundle the specimens uh, and put them into big Ziploc bags and uh, douse them with alcohol, rubbing alcohol, so they uh, wouldn't spoil and become moldy before we got back to uh, the museum to dry them on, on uh, Babbled Alb. Once the specimens were pressed, uh, they're put into these presses and put on uh, over dryers heated by light bulbs. You can see one here, Tim is um, bundling it up. And uh, things like mosses and liverworts were put into small packets. Um, they don't involve pressing or drying in the, the plant dryer. They were actually much easier to deal with, I think, than some of the big bulky <laughs> plants that we collected, such as palms and pandans. Uh, just to share some of the highlights of the trip, uh, we spent three days on uh, Peleliu, which is located to the south of the main island, Bobble Daub. It's, um, it's limestone and uh, covered by mangroves, as you can see here. This was a shot taken by uh, Ben Nyberg uh, from his drone to give you an overview of what the uh, part of the island looks like. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to bring the truck, museum truck along on the, uh, on the boat, the supply boat. It only had room for one vehicle, so we, we lucked out in getting, our, getting the truck uh, to go along with us. Uh, and it was a good uh, mobile field station for pressing plants. One of the areas we uh, looked at was the, the Trail of Hope, and this is um, on the high ridge of the island known as Bloody Nose Ridge, which was a scene of a, a really bloody battle during World War II. Um, but the vegetation is pretty much um, regenerated now and recovered. You can see some of the large trees here. This is a bread nut tree. So we're able to document the plants growing along this Trail of Hope and uh, 
increase the knowledge of what, what's growing on Peleliu, add to the checklist. Um, as I said, it was a scene of a World War II uh, battle and there's still unexploded ordnance. So we had to stay on the, on the trail and uh, not wander too far off. You can just see some of the remnants from the, from the battles of World War II along the trail. <clears throat> Another area that was really exciting was the Rock Islands. Um, it's to orient you here, Peleliu is just to the south of the main island of Babeldaab and all of these other islands are known as the Rock Islands. Uh, they consist of upraised uh, ancient limestone reefs uh, covered by uh, evergreen, tropical evergreen forest and with a lot of really interesting uh, native species and uh, there's the whole area is protected by a, a large barrier reef around most of it. So it's quite um, calm waters and there are a lot of sea grasses and corals and uh, marine life all around this area. We were able to uh, stop at a number of uh, spots in the Rock Islands. This was part of the 70 Islands Preserve, which is a very sensitive uh, conservation area. And we were uh, able to go there for one day um, I wish we could have spent more time there because we picked up some interesting species like this um, possibly new species of philanthus and the white trumpet shaped flower you see here is uh, sort of the national flower of uh, Palau. It's called Bikia palauensis. Just some more action shots from the field and in the rock islands. You can see the sort of undercutting of the, um, by the ocean of the, the islands. And some of them are mushroom shaped, others are uh, quite a bit larger. And uh, some areas are covered by this rare endemic palm. And also a native cycad grows here. And here are the um, two of our team members were uh, recovering, were rescuing actually a cycad specimen that had fallen into the water after it was collected. It's a cone and a big leaf. And here um, Uma's cradling it and <laughs> getting it ready for uh, processing on the boat. We use the state boat. Um, this all had to be done with the uh, permission of the state of uh, Koror. And, um, but it was a, a very exciting uh, day. Some of the plants um, in Palau include a high, high number of orchids, about 80 species actually. And you can see some of them here. This slide is um, courtesy of Uma. But some of the orchids have tiny little flowers and they're actually leafless. All you have are the roots, the green chlorophyllous roots. Others are large and showy. Um, about 35% of the um, orchids are actually endemic to Palau. And there's actually a nice book on the orchids of Palau. Many of the lagoons uh, are carpeted by sea grasses. Um, at the shallow, <clears throat> shallow sandy areas. And there are nine different species of seagrasses in Palau. Um, I, have a, I like to snorkel, so I was able to collect some of them and uh, process them for pressing. They're an important food source for um, sea turtles and, and the dugong, which is related to the manatee and also um, provide protection for uh, marine life, fishes and things. So they're flowering plants actually, the marine plants, but they are they're angiosperms. Um, pitcher plants, there's one species of pitcher plant in Palau, uh, Nepenthes, which is really cool looking. It uh, has these pitchers that trap insects. They fall, insects fall in there and decompose. So the plant benefits from the nitrogen uh, from the decomposing insects. And they're often on poor soils, nutrient poor soils. In the center, you see the um, flowers of one of the Nepenthes. Uh, one area of focus was on the, uh, the mosses and liverworts and lichens and Tim Flynn, our herbarium collection manager, uh, concentrated on collecting those and um, he collected about 250 uh, different specimens which are now the core collection for the uh, Bilal National Museum. They didn't have any uh, specimens in this group previous to our trip. Mosses and liverworts, are, they're living sponges so they're really important in the uh, and retaining water in the ecosystem and also provide a substrate for plants like orchids to grow on. In the lower right, you see a, uh, some lichens on a, on a tree trunk and there's a moth sort of camouflage or trying to camouflage 
uh, with the lichens, but um, it didn't quite land in the right place. It was overlapping in two colors. But these, um, a set of these collections were deposited at the uh, herbarium in Palau. Uh, new fern species, Ken Wood and uh, Uma, uh, focused on ferns, and they were able to collect actually a number of interesting, very interesting ones, some of them quite small. They, they, Ferns are very diverse in Palau, and many of them grow on tree trunks, they're epiphytes. So two, possibly two new species and one new uh, record for the country. Uh, some of the conservation implications are uh, from the drone work actually were very important. Uh, as I mentioned, Ben Nyberg brought the drone down, um, his drone down and was able to, at the request of the government, uh, do a survey of this rare species of uh, forest tree, Parkia, Parvifoliola, on the main island of Babeldaab. Um, there were only about 50 trees known previously, but he increased the, in, the number uh, by about tenfold, so uh, recording over 500 individuals uh, with the drone. You can see the green spots, uh, which are all new, new Parkia trees that were mapped. And as I mentioned, we worked as a team with our uh, local counterparts, uh, collecting and um, sometimes even providing shoulder support. <laughs> Your Tim and uh, Nero are supporting Svea, who's actually reaching a very high branch uh, for collecting a specimen. We also enjoyed the, uh, the warmth and culture of the Palauan people. Uh, they're an island nation. They're, they have, uh, love seafood, uh, fish, and mangrove crabs. There's a lot of mangrove vegetation around Palau, as well as clams and uh, various other delicacies. Uh, they grow taro, which this is a type of uh, taro called swamp taro or hard taro. It's kind of a yellowish one. It's much more firm than the one grown here in Hawaii, although they, they do grow that one as well. And they also enjoy uh, certain local delicacies like fruit bats. And uh, this is a fruit bat soup that uh, is a culturally important uh, food item, actually. Well, the, the trip was a very, very successful one. We were able to collect uh, some 840 uh, collection numbers between the, the team members and with about three duplicates each. This came to something like 2,500 specimens, uh, as I mentioned, with emphasis on the under-collected groups like mosses and ferns and things like that. Here are their specimen processing at the museum. Uh, once the specimens were dry, they were organized. The set was taken out for the um, Lao National Museum here. And then the rest were packed up in boxes, 13 boxes, which were sent back uh, to Hawaii by uh, the Postal Service. And they actually arrived, I think, the same day or a day, day after we re returned from Palau. So we were lucky to get all, all 13 boxes. And now um, we're processing them, identifying some of the um, ones that need a little further work. Tim uh, has printed out the labels and uh, we'll be uh, having them mounted up eventually in our herbarium and duplicates sent to other uh, herbaria such as the Smithsonian. Our field work pointed out the need for additional field work, basically. So um, there are other areas that need further exploration, including the, the tropical forests, um, as well as the rock islands. And um, eventually we'll be producing a, a flora of, of uh, Micronesia. And this basically involves a lot of different steps. And I've, some of them are listed here. I won't go through all of them uh, in the interest of time, but um, there definitely there's additional work to do. You've got to um, re review the literature and the existing specimens and in other um, institutions, other herbaria, database them and update the identifications and so forth. <clears throat> and that way you can figure out uh, where the gaps are. <clears throat> To identify, you know, additional fieldwork needs, uh, and then update the checklist of the species that occur there, and then there's the writing phase as well, and publishing if you find new species, 
And all of this uh, contributes to the IUCN red list uh, assessments and the knowledge of the flora. And um, I hope it's going to be useful to yeah, the local communities as well. So next steps, uh, there'll be an article in the NTBG bulletin that you should uh, look out for. I think it's in the next issue. Um, so I worked on that and uh, with John Letman, the editor, and continue looking at the social media updates and um, team members are, are working on um, completing the uh, field trip project by the specimen processing, um, writing reports to the uh, federal and uh, state governments as well. It's part of our agreement. And then we'll finally be developing a plan for a five-year flora project. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a flora of Micronesia uh, published and then the website updated. So there is a, a link, I think Amanda may have dropped it into the, uh, the comments if you wanted to look at this. Uh, it's hosted by the Smithsonian Institution and um, NTBG. Um, and that about wraps it up for my presentation. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Nina now and uh, if you have any questions, I guess we'll uh, address them at the end of the um, towards the end of the webinar. So thank you very much. Mahalo and thanks. Hello. Thanks, Dave. I have, a, I have a quick question for you. What was mm -hmm. it like navigating the Rock Islands by boat? Well, fortunately, the uh, boat pilot was uh, <laughs> knew the area very well. I probably would have gotten lost in the first. Uh, <laughs> first hour or so because it's very complicated. There are many rock islands and uh, yeah, these guys, they know the rock islands, definitely. They've grown up there, they fish and uh, navigate there all the time. But yeah, it was fantastic just visiting these islands. Okay, well, I'll stop sharing and uh, hand it over to you, Amanda. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so Nina, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. That would be great. Yes, I'm muted. Um, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that um, little trip with the uh, with Dave um, to Micronesia. So um. What I wanted to talk a little bit about is all these collections that have been brought back on this specific trip. It was a primary herbarium collections, but over those um, last decade where we've been working there, we've also been bringing back living plants. Um, and this is something botanical gardens all over the world have been doing for uh, maybe a hundred years or so, and kind of amassing huge living collections, uh, both local plants, but also from elsewhere. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, let me just see how I move this. There we go. Um, yeah, so botanical gardens are essentially um, housing scientific collections and that differentiates them, of course, from our own gardens at home or a park or something where it's a nice place to be and it's a beautiful display, but most of what's there has come from the local nursery. So botanical gardens are, are really collections um, that are and brought back usually from uh, the wild and um, everything is kind of recorded and documented. Um, so you can have uh, vouchers or herbarium specimens that Dave was showing you a lot of what's been collected. And that's really essential for being able to check on the identity of a species or if you find something new and want to compare with the original collection, um, a photo is not very far from detailed enough. So you can get back to those and uh, and record all the details and you have all the information about where they were collected, the habitat and so on. So they can also be looked at later to see if changes in distribution have happened and so on. So many uses, um, but also all the actual plants that are brought down into the collections, um, they need to be continuously documented. So here's an example of um, Hibiscus waimea hanarei that um, was collected um, up in, in the upper Limahuli um, Valley on the photo just before. And for all of those different collections we've been making, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, they, are, they are all kind of recording in our system. So you can, for each individual plant, 
trace it back to what was the original mother plant out in, in the wild. And this is really, really important for understanding conservation and so on, because you want to make sure if you are going um, and doing a restoration project that you are out planting things in the right place where they will thrive and where you're not creating potential problems with hybridization and, and so on. So yeah, just to give you a slight idea about that these collections are, are much more than the plants, there's tons of data behind them. Um, and um, here's an example of uh, how we work with, with those collections. For example, it's a Brickamia in sickness, which is now extinct in the wild uh, here on Kauai. You can see on the left photo, this is the last plant um, recorded on the Nepali coast um, some years ago, and it's no longer there, unfortunately. Um, but it thrives very well in botanical gardens. Um, many of them, it's kind of the same uh, plant that has just been, been copied or, or cloned, um, but there's also variety present. And it thrives here in Limahuli Garden, uh, you can see, um, and also in our nursery where Shanna Walls has been studying this plant for um, quite a number of years, is kind of working on trying to find a way to save it and bring it back in the wild. Um, that includes an experiment um, with using the different collections to try to improve on the genetic diversity again and see if we can get something that is more healthy. It's not very good for plants to get totally inbred. Um, they won't survive um, in the wild if, if that happens. And so that's the same with people, I guess. It's not so healthy for us either. So a big outplanting experiment of Brickamia in Sydney is happening here in Limahuli too. And this is really important work because the endemicity in Hawaii is very high, meaning that the plants that are found nowhere else on Earth is about 90% um, of our almost 1400 native um, vascular plants here that only exist in Hawaii. But at the same time, um, they're also um, exposed to a rather high extinction rate um, in the official um, Endangered Species Act register. Um, more than 50% of Hawaii's native flora is already listed as threatened and endangered. And it's a much higher proportion if you look at the IUCN Red List assessment. And you can ask, why is that, that these differ? And um, that has to do with um, that not everything is registered on the, under the US Endangered Species Act. And if it hasn't been assessed, we don't really have that kind of information. Um, so there's both a question of capacity and priority and many other things. Um, so the red listing is kind of becoming the internationally recognized place to go if you want to know what's threatened and what not. But again, the problem is if it's not there, you actually don't know and you cannot mistake that for that everything is safe. So we started some years ago looking at the endemic um, plants on Kauai and at that point there were very few red listed. And over some years we managed to get all 250 assist and according to IUCN red list criteria, they are all either threatened or endangered. And this has, of course, to do with that they are really relatively narrow endemic that are only found on Kauai, and that in itself is, is a little bit of a risk, but also a high number, more than 80 of them, are down to less than 50 individuals in the wild. And um, this is kind of a general problem for a lot of oceanic islands, that um, things have kind of really been developing on those islands without really much disturbance. Um, and so a lot of unique species have been developed and it's also often very small areas. Um, and so it's really kind of um, relatively easy for them to get threatened if there's new invasive weeds coming in or animals that weren't there or even, even people or, um, yeah, um, it could be also big events, just kind of one big flooding event or a landslide can actually um, kind of reduce a whole uh, plant population or even a species. But as you can see, Hawaii is, is really up there in high numbers. Um, and um, the area that we work primarily in is the Pacific Islands, um, which is also part of the Polynesia and Micronesia Biodiversity Hotspot. Um, this was um, what Dave was just showing you. Uh, we've been working on different floras. We're not the only ones working there, of course, but um, it's been a major program for us for many years. Um, so I try to add that to the map here. Uh, you can see it's very often you have to extend maps to include the Pacific because most maps, maps either have the US or Europe in, in, in the center. But so I've, I've cheated a little bit and extended it here. And then you can see we get now Micronesia and Samoa and Marquesas added on. Um, also um, a, a relatively high amount of endemicity. And you can say it's not as much as 90%, but it's still quite a lot of plants that are really um, unique to those places. So the question then is, um, so what's actually in the botanical gardens? And there was a paper by Mount and um, some collaborators a couple of years ago, and they looked at this. Um, so um, we all kind of starting to use various databases to kind of try to summarize um, data and 
Um, the Botanical Garden Conservation International is kind of an umbrella organization for botanical gardens, and they have some pretty good um, databases of sampling information. So um, globally, there's more than 3,000 botanical gardens uh, registered in 180 countries, and about a third of those are actually members of, of this BGCI, and so we have data from them in, in their bases. And together, they have more than 100,000 different species. So that's actually about a third of the world's flora that is kind of presented in botanical gardens. That's that's pretty nice to know. It makes me sleep better for sure. Um, but it's also interesting to know that more than 90% of these gardens, they occur primarily in the Northern Hemisphere. And maybe a little bit logical to that, it's also a huge focus on temperate species and also vascular plants, flowering plants and so on. Uh, overrepresented. You just heard also Dave mentioning that there wasn't a single moss collected out in Palau before um, they came out there. And that's kind of very typical for botanical gardens as well. A lot of focus on trees and flowering plants. And it's understandable why. Um, so if we look at, um, again, what's in those garden collections, there was another paper that has been um, tracing that a little bit. And it turns out that more than 50% of the threatened species are actually not even held in the country of origin. Um, so about 10% of garden collections are focused on threatened species. And the other ones are really more about um, showing diversity and for teaching and display and so on. But the, of those 10%, it's pretty impressive again that that actually covers about 40% of what we know as threatened plant species in collections. Again, that helps me really sleep better. Um, but again, with over half of it not really being in the country of origin, um, it makes them a little bit of a kind of a silent archive because who's working on them and what are they being used for? Um, and so I've gotten a little bit interested in that. So um, because, of course, as you saw, the flora of Micronesia is work in progress. I can't give you a lot of details on that, but I can on the flora of Marquesas, um, which we just published um, last year. There's a link uh, here if you want to um, to see that flora. Um, I think um, probably Amanda can, can find a link to an article about it as well. But so the flora of Marquesas um, basically was completed and it includes about 331 species. Um, so this was collaboration with Smithsonian and with um, the, the kind of French overseas um, expeditions and so on. Um, about 50% or 47% of those are endemic, only occurring on these islands. And in this flora work, 85 new species were discovered and described. So that's really impressive. That's an increase in the flora with about 25%. And it just shows you how important this flora work is because if there was a quarter of the species that weren't really registered or known, um, that of course has influences on what's conserved and, and why and how, and even on the understanding of the ecosystem. Again, also ferns and allies, um, these lower plants also are really high proportion of the flora of many islands. So it makes it very important to get those, um, the attention that they need as well. Um, so if we look at um, how these plants are doing in terms of being threatened, again, at the IUCN red list, there's very, very few that have actually been assessed. Um, so if you use that one, only about 8% of the flora is threatened because the rest is either not assessed or not much is known about it. Um, very few of them are considered of least concern or pretty, pretty safe. Um, that's only about 10%. Um, and again, it depends on what's being assessed. So you could also use Fred Search, which is another database that Botanical Gardens Conservation International hosts. And it combines both assessments from the red list, but also of national red lists, so not the global ones. Um, and so that gives you a lot more information here because um, the French, uh, in French Polynesia, there's kind of a, a national red list. Um, so a lot of them have been assessed for that. And now we suddenly see that about 74% of the endemic species of Marquesas are actually threatened. So that's a whole different picture and somewhat alarming again. If we look back into what's in the collections, um, about uh, 25 species are actually existing or reported in the BGCI collections. And 22 of those um, are of threatened species. So we've got a coverage of about 30% of threatened um, Marquesas endemic flora. But um, they actually exist in only two collections, most of them. And there's a couple of them that only are in one collection. And then there's one here, uh, Libronesia cucuoides, that actually exists in 19 collections. Maybe this has to do with that it's in the same family as, as hibiscus. Um, and so it's kind of a really nice plant to have in, in collections. But um, 
yeah, that's kind of a little bit um, worrying that there's so many that if just one garden loses its one plant, then maybe it's lost. So it's about a number game as well. Here's an example, Epitahia longistigmata uh, from the Marquesas Islands um, that was collected here on Tahuata Island. And um, you can see the herbarium specimen here being made. And then a seed collection that ended up in the NTDB seed bank, which is a pretty good safe place to house these um, plants under the right conditions. And so first and foremost, of course, the collections, especially the herbarium specimens, are really the basis of a flora. Without those documenting what's been found and, and what occurs where, um, we don't really have the overview of what we're trying to protect or understand. But collections are also used for a lot of other things. Um, for example, here, um, there was a DNA analysis done on leaf material from um, the NTPG collection um, of Pelagodoxa palm here. And that helps show that the Pelagodoxy henryi is actually a unique species to the Marquesas Islands that is different from uh, the only other species in that genus that is more common in Melanesia. So understanding that sort of thing really helps us um, to kind of know that we need to pay extra attention to the conservation of this species. Um, here's another example, Hernandia nymphefolia collections um, that we have from French Polynesia. They've been used by Indris and Lawrence to study the breeding system that turned out to be rather unique in this genus. So um, you can uh, yeah, repropagate the plant and, and do experiments like that as well when you have a living collection. Um, here's a more recent example, a master student, Natalie Miro, uh, who wanted to understand what um, people were using locally in Hawaii for um, kind of type 2 diabetes and was kind of interviewing people and looking up um, old information. And um, then she was screening um, several of the plants that she could find in the garden that were either the same reported or, or were close relatives. Um, so, and two of those um, come from um, the Micronesian flora project as well. So um, they can be used for a lot of different things. Um, so in summary, you could say collections are used for research, but it's also important that there's actually research about the collections. So what do I mean with that? I mean, that's the research that will help us understand the plants even better and help us understand how to take better care of them. Um, and then, of course, um, with so few collections being rather randomly distributed here and there, there is a need for better collection planning uh, to overcome some of these biases of what's not collected and what's not represented and what there's far too few um, kind of living collections of. Um, and then these um, collections can actually be supporting conservation both in ex situ, so that would be, for example, in, in the seed bank or in the gardens, or in situ, um, kind of helping with um, maintaining or re-establishing populations in the wild. And of course, they can also be used for education and, and collaboration. And as Dave also mentioned, that's a really important part of a flora program, that you're not just producing a book that goes on a shelf, but you actually go and talk to the authorities and to the local conservation practitioners and so on, and um, and make sure that people are using this information um, responsibly to, to try to protect their flora. And most importantly, of course, um, the needs of what needs to be done uh, really needs to be defined with people in the country um, who, um, who kind of um, are hosting or, or having the plants and, and who also are the ones who can really take good care of them. And yeah, um, with a nice little uh, fern here at the end, um, thank you for listening to this and I will be handing back to Amanda. Thank you, Nina. Uh, so we had uh, our first question come through from Phyllis. She's wondering about the rules for shipping specimens to the US. Do you have to get advanced permission before one of your um, trips? Uh, what are the restrictions? Um, I can take that question. It's a good one because um, it differs between herbarium specimens, dry press specimens, and, and living materials such as seeds and cuttings. Uh, <clears throat> basically, the seeds and cuttings uh, need to be inspected by uh, the phytosanitary service before they're you know, sent back, and uh, we should have, a, NTBG should have a, you know, a permit for bringing them in. Sometimes it's, it's not possible to know ahead of time what you're going to collect. Uh, if you're like targeting breadfruit or something like that, you, you would know. But for our project, uh, we really didn't know what we'd be collecting. And it turns out there were, uh, you know, hundreds of collections. 
but usually the dried specimens can um, get through the um, USDA APHIS inspection in Honolulu without any problem. We did um, send them a list of what we had collected uh, before we sent them, but um, they came through clear sailing. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And I, I forgot to mention it before I asked that first question, but uh, everybody, you're welcome to drop questions for either Dave or Nina into the chat box um, or use the Q&A feature. Uh, either one works for us. We'll keep an eye on both of those. Um, so Dave, can, can you tell us a little bit about what's happened to those specimens since arriving back at the BRC or Botanical Research Center? I should say. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. <clears throat> well, any um, spe incoming specimens and books also um, are um, frozen for two weeks, actually, before they're brought into the, uh, the clean part of the uh, BRC. We have a specimen processing room, uh, which is called, we call it the dirty room, actually, because we can bring plants in there and press them up. And um, it's not considered to be the uh, clean inner part of the building. So you run them through the uh, walk-in freezer uh, for about two weeks and hopefully to um, kill any, you know, insects or insect eggs that might be in the specimens. Uh, and then they're brought in. Um, after they're brought in, they're, um, they adjust to room temperature and then they can be separated out. And um, Tim Flynn, our collections curator, uh, actually prints up the labels for the specimens. Each collector has to input the label data in, in our database, though, so, um, independently. <clears throat> so that's something we worked on. Actually, when we were in the field, we were able to access our database, um, you know, through Wi-Fi and, and start inputting the data so it wouldn't all be <laughs> left to our return. So I think almost most of the um, participants are already in, have already inputted their data. And then we'll select, uh, you know, a, a set out for mounting uh, for our herbarium and the other uh, duplicates if will be um, sent out unmounted to other collect, uh, museums such as Smithsonian or the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. That's basically the process. And then they'll be eventually filed away into our, our herbarium cabinets uh, with their cousins. You know, it's all alph alphabetically arranged by families. Thank you. Um, Janet was wondering, when was this collecting trip to Palau? Uh, it was from mid-June uh, mid to mid-July. We had spent just about a month there, actually, and uh, spent the 4th of July on Palau. And, <laughs> and uh, another Palau-related question from Donna. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they're wondering, do you think the World War II battles permanently altered the flora of the island um, or caused any loss of species? Um, hmm, that's, that's a good question. Um, the flora se certainly seems to have regenerated on, on islands like Peleliu, which was one of the hardest uh, hit, I guess, during the battle. I've seen pictures from the 1940s. The vegetation was basically destroyed, level flat, uh, the trees, but imagine there were a lot of uh, seeds in the, the soil seed bank and others, you know, re-sprouted. Uh, we don't really know um, if there any were lost, uh, because I don't think there was a, a checklist from Palau that dates back to that time. There were Japanese botanists who had worked in, in Micronesia during the uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, and they um, they, made, they collected specimens and made some some lists of uh, species on the islands, but yeah, not sure. It's but at least we have a baseline now from our, our last trip there on uh, what exists. Mahalo. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if either of you have any last words you'd like to say before uh, I wrap it up. I'll pass it over to Nina. Um, yeah, I don't really have any. No, I, I oh, guess wait. we just want to say thank you for joining us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we hope to see you again at another webinar. Um, Thanks, Nina. And we had um, 
two questions come through while I was asking that. Okay. Um, oh, one person was asking about Palau's invasive monkey. Did you encounter that, uh, Dave, while you were there? Are they hurting any native plants? Um, the invasive monkeys, are, they're located on another island, which is actually farther south than Peleliu. It's called Anguar, Anguar Island. And I, I've been there, um, I think it was about 10 or 12 years ago, and there were a lot of monkeys <laughs> on Anguar. Uh, and there are long-tailed macaques, so they're a pretty aggressive uh, monkey species. And certainly they would, um, you know, impact any native bird nesting because it probably would, you know, eat the egg, bird eggs and maybe the nestlings and things like that. But fortunately, they're not on any of the other islands uh, besides Anguar. Thank you. Uh, okay. And to... Uh, just to let folks know, uh, the recording is going to be available. We'll follow up with that recording in an email to you all uh, within the next few days. And then here's one last question. This question is from Peter. In okay. relation to trips as the one to Palau, when time is limited and the team can visit just a fraction of the island area, do you have some way to estimate how much known unknown there is in terms of local plant diversity? Or in other words, how comfortable do you feel to say there are X, Y species of plants native to Palau, which I guess will be the outcome of the flora book? Um, well, in the case of Palau, which um, <clears throat> may not be representative of other Micronesian islands, uh, there's been a lot of work done by local botanists, uh, notably Anne Kidalong, who um, she was actually a Peace Corps volunteer who served there back in the 70s and married uh, uh, a local Palauan and uh, became head of the herbarium, uh, took over the herbarium. So she's written books on the orchids and ferns and the native trees. Uh, but that's, so I would feel confident that we know the flora of Palau pretty well, maybe 95 or 98% um, complete flora listing, but other islands probably still need more field work uh, to be done. There's not as much known about them. I mean, the U.S. Forest Service has done some surveys um, because of, many of these islands are or were uh, U.S. territories. They've surveyed the, uh, the timber um, that's available in, you know, woody species, but they didn't pay much attention to like, um, you know, some of the herbaceous plants and especially like small mosses, uh, small ferns. As you saw from Ken Wood's work, you know, we have Two, possibly two new fern species from Palau and you know one new country record so yeah I guess it varies from island to island but you can of course also say that what we do is is a is a stamp in time right we, we can't know mm -hmm. exactly for sure what was there what will be there or if we found everything but with knowing nothing we we know nothing and <laughs> we can't do mm -hmm. much so but yeah when do you actually say enough is enough we've collected enough we should start writing a book um, and it kind of becomes a judgment based on how broad we've been collecting before and who else have been doing it and what, what all is already known and comparing those, making some common sense about it can't be that this island has this many species and then the neighbor one has nothing. It's probably because we didn't mm -hmm. look enough. Um, there are actually also statistical methods that can help kind of get an indication of, of these things. Really good question. Very good, yeah. And the drone brings in a new tool also for surveying areas uh, such as those peaks uh, that are in your background, Nina, <clears throat> which I think are on Ponape Island. Um, yeah, we were discovering new species here on Hawaii uh, with the drone work, and a lot. You know, it's it's uh, an island that's been relatively well botanized over the years. I would say. Well, thank you so much to you both uh, for. Uh, jumping on the webinar today uh, and taking us to uh, Micronesia, Dave. Okay, well, thank so, you. So, uh, like I mentioned, we will be following up with an email, and I'll have the links in that email to register for our future webinars if you didn't catch it earlier in the chat. Uh, and you can also feel free to reply to me if you guys had any questions you thought about um, afterwards or if we didn't get to one of your questions today. We'd also love to hear your feedback and hear about what you want us to talk to you about next. 
So I'll um, drop the survey link in the chat right there, and I'll also include the survey in our email as well. We really appreciate uh, to hear back from you all and help improve our next session. And with that, it's one o'clock. So just mahalo nui, everybody, and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Okay. Aloha.